Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another discussion right here on the 7th Annual Angaya 2022 East African Music Summit. The theme for this webinar has been embracing the new normal, and we want to unpack that in today's topic, where we will be talking about the evolution of African music yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now, I am your moderator, Gracie May, and I am joined by a distinguished panel of guests who will be sharing their thoughts, feelings, and opinions on this topic. Now, I know that we have been used to having this panel physically, given that five years, um, for the first five years, it was in person, uh, and the last two years have been webinars, but we want to make sure that this is as interactive and engaging as possible. So I'm going to encourage you to use the Q&A box, which is just to the right of your screen. Please send in questions as we discuss. Please make sure you add your name, where you're chatting in from, and please make sure that your question is as specific as possible. If you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or Airme, you can also join in the conversation on social media. Feel free to use the hashtag. And that is me done with the I guess housekeeping rules, I think it'd be good for us to introduce you to our amazing panel. So without further ado, I'd like to list the guys that we've got on screen right now, and then I'll give them some time to give you a mini intro about them. So we've got Mr. Aldu, founder and executive vice chairman of Chocolate City Group based in Nigeria and the US. You've got Mr. Lawyer, performing artist from a union, we also have Mr. Munya, the founding and managing director of Masters of the Industry in Empire Publishing Zimbabwe, as well as singer, songwriter, performing artist and creative entrepreneur, MDQ. So we'll do a virtual round of applause and we'll start with Mr. Aldi to give us a couple of lines on who you are, what you do, before we crack on to the next person. Go ahead, over to you, Mr. Aldi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Gracie, and, and thanks for the platform. Uh, my name is Alju Mikori. I'm an attorney and also worked in the music business for about maybe 70 years. I'm kidding. Uh, 18 years. Uh, I basically worked across, you know, starting a record label, um, setting up a publishing company, uh, an agency. Um, most currently, we're going into film production. Um, I'm very passionate about Africa. I'm very passionate about the creative industries because I believe that it is a pathway, not just for wealth creation, but I think that it helps to reinforce our culture and brings people together in a way that no other form can. Um, for me, what's exciting is that there's now a renewed global interest, especially from African governments, where they're now looking at the creative industries as a means to empower people. And it's, it's exciting for me personally, because when, when I left uh, my, my cushy job as an attorney in a, in a top consulting firm, uh, I was told that that was probably the most stupid decision I ever took. Um, a few years later now, the world is moving towards our music, our culture. So thank you so much for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much for that introduction. And we can't wait to hear what you've got in store for the panel. All right, let's move on to Mr. Lawyer. A few lines about you. Hi, Gracie. Hi, everybody. I'm Loya. I'm, I'm from Réunion. So I produce electronic music uh, for uh, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm blending my uh, uh, traditional music uh, called Maloya with uh, el electronic uh, music. And also, uh, I travel over uh, uh, Indian Ocean uh, to Mauritius, uh, Madagascar, uh, Comoros. And uh, to today, uh, this year, I go to Sri Lanka too to collaborate with uh, some master that uh, uh, know the tra traditional music. And uh, I produce album uh, with uh, some uh, musicians there. Uh, for example, I, I have uh, an album with Menoir. Menoir is, uh, uh, for me, a master musician from Mauritius. He plays percussion and he, he is a great singer. And also, uh, I have a forthcoming uh, album with uh, Remalindri. Remalindri is an um, artist from uh, Madagascar, the south of Madagascar. And uh, he's a shaman, and uh, uh, he's making a spiritual uh, mu music. And uh, he have uh, it was a pleasure for me to collaborate with uh, with him and his family to share uh, this uh, kind of music with the world. Thank you for having me, having me uh, uh, in this conversation. Thank you. 
Merci, c'est très bon. All right, there was me trying to practice my French. Um, let me not embarrass myself any further. Mr. Munya, shall we hand over to you? Greetings and greetings, everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Munya Chinetsa, originally from Zimbabwe, but based in South Africa, Johannesburg. Uh, I'm the newly appointed managing director for Africa for Empire Publishing, which is extremely, extremely exciting time for me. Um, I recently joined Empire and it just seemed the place of choice for me, considering their view on things and how they are, how they, how they are approaching the industry. Um, they're not, not using such traditional methods such as owning masters like where they did and, and looking at more more partnering with creatives more than anything, which is which is something which I think we really need more than anything. Um, and, and, and on the other hand, I'm also the founder of an online platform called Moti Africa. Moti stands for Masters of the Industry. And Moti Africa is just, it's an online platform which I felt was very much needed by the African industry just to give us, in my head, I was just like, you know, let's give us a chance in this industry because there's so much, there's so much we don't know. There's a big information gap, especially within our industry. Um, you know, it often looks quite easy, the things that, that we do, but, you know, people neglect the business side of things. Hence why we see a lot of um, challenges, wrong agreements being signed, et cetera, et cetera, happening in 2022. And I mean, ideally, the, the, the plan is to educate, empower and enable creators so that they make better decisions ultimately for themselves and for the betterment of the industry. So, so that is who I am. And thank you for the platform. Amazing, uh, great to hear all the wonderful work you're doing. And we'll unpack that a little bit more as we continue to discuss. Okay, last but not least, the only female panelist, females doing it for themselves, MDQ, welcome to the stage. Please give us a mini introduction. Thank you, Gracie. Really happy to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Modoni Drama Queen. Um, by profession, I'm a musician. I sing, I rap, and I play a set of uh, traditional drums from my country, Kenya. Um, the process of becoming an artist in a place where we don't have structured support led me into some interesting segues. So I founded a festival called Blankets and Wine, which is in its 13th year. We are in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. Uh, the idea of the festival is to give space for African artists to connect directly with audiences. Um, to import and export our culture to one another and to our diaspora. Um, I am also a founder of the Four Music Incubator, which has been running since 2019. The idea with the incubator really is to build out the skill set required to make the music uh, industry really professionalized. We have run three cohorts so far between 2019 and 2021. Uh, we have trained 105 professionals, so artist managers, event producers, music publicists, uh, artist songwriters, uh, music producers, sound and lighting engineers. We have just um, this year won a second grant to run phase two of the incubator and we will be transitioning a certain number of artists um, into phase two to work deeply with them to create music and to put it out. Our strategy there is high volume, high frequency of release, um, accompanied by high frequency release of lo-fi content. We will also be running an apprentice program for managers, publicists, and event producers. The idea there is to help um, not help really facilitate uh, the deepening of that skill set by working directly under industry leaders. And the third thing we are doing is digitization of our curriculum. Um, the idea here is to um, allow many more young Africans to learn um, this skill set that the sector badly needs from the comfort of their homes. So I'm really happy to be here to share insights. I'm also happy to be hanging out with people I haven't seen in a long time, like Munya, who we met like years ago in South Africa. And Audu, I think who I met many years ago in Nairobi when he was here with MI. And I'm really happy to meet you, Loya. I think that's uh, 
I really am looking forward to discovering more of your music. And of course, you, Gracie, you're, you know, a boss. So it's very happy to be, I'm very happy to be networked with you. I love that. A lot of communal love just there. Um, I think it might be time for me to give a couple of lines about me before we get into this 19 minute discussion on how we see the evolution of African music yesterday, today and tomorrow. So a few lines about me. Um, I am an Afrobeat entertainment journalist. Um, I've been in the business now for about seven years. I've interviewed everybody from David O to Tua Savage, Yemi Alade, including East Africa's finest diamond platinums and over 300 more across print, uh, radio, and TV. Uh, my strap line is amplifying African arts and I do that in every single way, whether it's the small content I've got on Instagram or TikTok, as well as obviously helping artists tell their stories and connect with different audiences. I'm really privileged to be the moderator for today's chat. And I think this is a nice segue for us to speak about Afrobeats, given that that is my specialism. Um, I think the first topic we'd like to unpack is how can we explain the unprecedented success of Nigerian Afrobeats to be specific, looking at breaking into the uh, mainstream, especially as we've just seen a video circulating this week with the head of the Grammys, Harvey Mason Jr. CEO, confirming that there is an African music slash Afrobeats awards in the works. We've got other examples right now, including you know the Billboard Afrobeats charts, um, and we've got collaborations from Ed Sheeran and Fireboy with Peru, Justin Bieber on Essence, um, and of course, many stadiums around the world. We've had people like Burner Boy sell out the Hollywood Bowl, being the first African to, to do that. We've had um, the same Burner Boy selling out Madison Square Garden, with kids having a three-day, three-day residency at the O2, um, 20,000 capacity each. I mean, Afrobeats is global. How do we explain the unprecedented success of this? And Aldi, you've, you've come off mute, so I'm going to say great to you. Uh, I was, I was hoping children uh, MDQ would go first. I was hoping she would go first. Um, but I think it's easy to know, you know, the shape of the iceberg, you know, but there's a lot under the water that's built movement. Uh, but let us look at that African music has been international for years. I'll give an example. There's a song called Smother. I don't know if you guys know. You guys know the song, Sweet Mother. Nobody knows the Sweet Mother. Nobody knows, it. Nobody knows the song. Wow. Okay, you guys Google the song. Google that song. It was released in 1976. It's 13 million records from a place called Calabar. It wasn't even Lagos. There's a guy called uh, Prince Nico Mbaga. That is probably to date the most uh, uh, the, the most successful African song. Um, and that was 1976. Um, and when you go beyond that and you think about what African music has done internationally over the years, there's been under. I think the biggest uh, catalyst for that is uh, social media. If you ask me, that's really what it is. But for a long time, of the typical African is that of poverty, charity, and, you know, handouts. Uh, and then now with social media, you can see how people actually live. You can see the rich culture. You know, you can see how people are, are actually, the level of education, the exposure that they have. And that brought a, a, some sort of social connection. But beyond that, I mean, before that, when you go back 10, 15 years ago, there's Oliver Twist. Uh, there was um, uh, this other song that was really big back in the UK that was, uh, was was all over the charts as well. There was um, uh, uh, OG, OG, uh, uh, OG, Fuse OG, Fuse OG did tracks with Ed Sheeran years ago. So really guys, there's, there's a lot going on, but what happened is come forward. Now, I want to also know that from an international perspective, Afrobeat is a generic term for African music, or should I say the new African music? So it's not necessarily about Nigeria or Ghana or whatever it is, but let's just say that the front runners are Nigerian uh, artists for 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 um, lack of better. I also think that you need to go back and understand the influence what what has brought this Afrobeat. And I tell people that Afrobeat actually is is um it's 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 a it's a buffet uh, of different things, right? It is. There's a strong South African influence in that, especially in the house music genre. 
there is high life music in Afrobeats. There is hip hop or, and pop music in Afrobeats. And what happens then is, is simply, it's, it's, it's just the brilliance of being able to put those, those things, those elements together. Because what happens in music generally is that people find things that they're familiar with. The reason why black music is so ubiquitous is that we are familiar with the drum. It's the drum that ties all black and brown people around the world. Anywhere in the world, there's that drum. And so with Afrobeat, it took elements from different parts and infused it with Pigeon English. And that also helped the Pigeon English cross over to parts of West Africa and the Caribbean. In fact, there's a strong Caribbean influence in Afrobeat music. You will hear it. <laughs> so um, this is what happens when people come together and collaborate. Um, and so I'll say that Afrobeats is, is successful because of the collaborative elements that's been in it and infused over time. But the fact too that traditionally black people drive culture around the world. Look at it in any part of the world, whether you're talking about fashion, when you're talking about um, uh, 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 storytelling, when you're talking about even hip hop, right? Even rap, uh, even jazz is black. So it's not really surprising. Uh, I think what is surprising is that it took off at a point in time and just skyrocketed. Uh, but I have good news for everyone that this is just the beginning. Grammy was started. There'll be more and more and more. And yes, I'm aware about the talk about Grammy and creating a category. It's great. But I think what is more important the last thing was um, awesome. I know African um, is doing a lot of ones many maybe twenty years ago. It was done in South Africa. Um African uh, award shows that celebrate beyond just artistry. Sound engineering, sound artistry, sound engineering, the technical things that help build industry. They're very critical because that's how we can sustain the growth industry. Otherwise, no Afrobeat, Afro music. Um, because that we can just make sure that the cultural revolution that will not destroy the world also sustain that as many people and through this how much marketing how much destination marketing happens because of afrobeat people are saying oh i'm going to go to africa in, in december but we open the doors for the rest of the call to be sold so how we position ourselves to take advantage of this time this boom this culture thank you Amazing. There were so many nuggets there. You spoke about collaboration. You spoke about black people driving culture. Um, and so I guess the conclusion there is it's not unprecedented success. It was always going to happen. I guess the question was when. You mentioned different genres as well within the continent. So, Mr. Lawyer, should we pass over to you, given that you do electronic, which is slightly left of field when we, when we think about traditional Afrobeat or African music. Um, please, let's hear your thoughts. I have the pleasure to collaborate with Tony Allen. He, he is uh, the drummer from Af Afrobeat. I, did, uh, uh, I make a two remix uh, for, for him. And uh, I, uh, I'm a, a great, great, great fan of uh, him and uh, Fela Kuti too. Uh, I'm uh, also a, a saxophonist player. So uh, I grew up with uh, the song of Fela. And, and uh, for me, Afrobeat uh, is everywhere because it, it's telling the truth, you know. It's telling the truth about the music, the rhythm is awesome. And also, uh, the talk about the, uh, that's uh, it, in the world, the politics things, and, and, and it, it's telling the truth. And, uh, you know, uh, there's also uh, guys like uh, Michael Jackson, he put uh, some 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 music from uh, from Africans like uh, uh, Manu Dubango uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, sample uh, the sample uh, in the music uh, is that I've uh, discovered the African music uh, uh, that's my fault. The Michael Jackson song I think you're referring to is Mama Say Mama Sama Makasa. Yes. But don't quote me. <laughs> um, with that said then, I feel like what you've just displayed is that there's been a history of pop mainstream music sampling 
um, African music, being invested in African music. And so, yeah, this is just the start, really. Um, MDQ, should we come to you? Let's specifically look at uh, a question that we've got in the um, in the Q and A box, which says, "In the US, the trend for Afrobeats is just starting to surface. More major labels are now starting to pay attention." And so, I'm going to translate that into a question and say, "Do you feel like we need backing from majors, or as a continent, are we self-sustainable?" Uh, that's a very loaded question. Um, look, I think that the majors, the majors have a, have their space in the growth and growth of Afrobeat because you know they built the infrastructure for years, and I think that they are the great. Um, they could service the growth because they're a great amplifier, right? But I don't think a major can make a movement. And I think they come in after the people themselves have made the movement, you know. And the thing that we are seeing uh, with Afrobeats, and I use it in the term meaning African music growing and growing, and obviously Nigeria being at the front, is that the artists, the creators themselves, have made a music product that speaks of the people for the people and by the people right and then the people on the continent are linking with the people outside the continent and sharing this music and building the superstars so at the point at which the majors find barnaboy barnaboy has already done a big part of the heavy lifting of building the core audience. Now, what the majors will help, and we are seeing it in real time with Bana or with Whiskid, um, Saudi Soul, is that they then allow Barna Boy to build a new level of audience. Because the majors are synced to radio across the world. So now Barna Boy's single, you know, can get out of the studio and get onto like playlisting on radio stations across America um, or you know specific markets in Europe. So it makes Banner Boy's ability to get a new audience um, greatly amplified and the time greatly reduced. Um, they also have the touring network. So whether they have the touring network through uh, affiliation with festivals or literal ownership with festivals or being able to do JVs with uh, people who um, put together the festivals, you know. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is there is space for the majors. And, and within the current framework of music, there is space for majors and they will continue to be useful. What I am curious about is the fundamental disruption that we're going to see and I'm calling it for like five years max, right? When the superstar is going to be a 13 year old um, boy or girl or, you know, non-binary person who sits in Nairobi and through software on his computer, or their computer has been able to make music and has shipped to audience directly on TikTok. I'm curious to see um, in that world, what the role of the majors will be, right? Um, but right now, for sure, I think we have some years and I think we should definitely, we should lean in. But this thing is only going to service the people who've already done the hard work, you know. I love that. The majors role is around amplification. They have the ecosystem. They have the network. I'll give you a couple of quick facts and then I'll come to you, Munya. Um, so the top five selling global concert tours of last year were Coldplay, who were able to garner four million dollars with an average ticket sale of seventy seven dollars. Kenny Chesney at three point six million for the year. 
Bad Bunny at 3.3 million for the year, The Eagles at 2.5 million for the year, and Elton John at 2.4 million for the year. Now, I actually have a list of the top 20, but I don't want to bore you. But it's very curious if you go through that list um, published by Bloomberg on the 13th of June, you'll see that unfortunately there isn't any African representation. And actually, there isn't much gender diversity there either. You've got Lady Gaga um, and a few others like Dua Lipa. But yeah, just very interesting to see that Coldplay were able to garner four million dollars from the um sales of the global concert last year and there isn't any african representation perhaps the majors can support with that munya you're at empire which i guess is an independent but are operating at a global level competing with universal and warner and sony so we'd like to hear your thoughts on this too um absolutely um so uh, well, well, I'll touch on first the Afrobeat question. You know, one, and this is just my personal experience. And this is when, when I first went to Nigeria as a young man. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed about Nigeria and Nigerian acts um, is the representation. A lot of the guys that, um, a lot of the artists, their management. You found that I would find out that a lot of them, including Otu in the in the, in the panel right now they they have the legal experience they have this legal background and you know legal is so important when it comes to this thing because it, it does aid in helping the creator make the correct decisions that actually help favor them and this was something i I'd noticed because being in south africa i noticed that not so many um managers or the management teams when it came to legal representation it was far and few in between a lot of them were being led by friends someone down the road who i've known and i trust you so now you're my manager so one of the things i did notice was that the legal representation in niger i think it definitely contributed to why nigeria has not even superstars but megastars um and i mean also with with the internet and we mustn't forget the diasporan market i don't know whether it's not, i feel there must have been i feel there was a switch as well where when it came to because i mean on the continent streaming is still something growing for us. I mean, with the, those of us who've got smartphones here, we're still a minority. And most of the streams that you end up seeing, if you have can, if you have a diasporan market that can stream, that's when you see true numbers. And I think a lot of Nigerian acts have successfully done that because um, they've now, they, they, they're now able to feed that Nigerian market without, let me just say, without necessarily having to rely on the traditional methods where you had to wait for radio and radio has its own politics. You have to wait for TV. TV has their own politics, whereas now with the invention of the internet, like, yeah, you can upload, you can talk to your market directly, and people can stream and, and access your content. So I think that also, and Nigeria has a massive market. I mean, Africans actually in general. And now, I mean, the rest of us have all jumped on, we're all supporting, we're supporting one another, which is a fantastic, beautiful thing. Um, and then to the to the next question, which you, I'm sorry, what is the next question that had to do with the, the the major labels. Labels. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, as as has been said, said um, majors do have their position and they're able to amplify, and that's all good and well. They've, they've established themselves deep roots and they're able to do the things. Um, however, one of the things that I've noticed, and one of the things which for Empire, and I know being an ambassador and being in a <laughs> being an Empire, I think if we've seen that the growth of some of the artists that have come out of empire for me i feel it's been ridiculous the time span and the the the, the, the success we've seen is it's it's been on 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 on, on how do i even say it's and it's, it's it's been at, at speeds which have been ridiculous how how we've seen fireball and i feel fireball's growth has been a level in terms of just in a global sense maybe it's been two three years but we see that it's happening in such an exponential rate it's ridiculous we're seeing what's happening with ashake we're seeing all this and you know um the one thing about empire which as i said earlier which i i really do love about empire is that um instead of that traditional model of you know owning masters and etc cetera, etc cetera, empire really are focusing on partnering empire doesn't actually own any masters we focus on licensing deals and that's on the label side which is fantastic and i mean and as i said it's partnering to build holistic brands it's not just about um investing in a song if you know what I mean, and the, it's holistically trying to understand the vision of these labels and what they're trying to achieve 
and really being a partner with them, going in 50-50 to figure out how do we make this, how do we achieve the goals that you want to achieve in the long run. Um, and, 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 well, and I'm on the publishing side, so Empire Publishing, which is um, and on the continent, is brand new for Empire. I'm the first employee on the publishing side, which is super exciting. I'm going to be building a team, but another set of creators, which I really um, I'm excited to really um, work on, is the songwriters and producers, who are more often than not the forgotten, they're the forgotten creators. And I mean, internationally, we've seen how um, uh, major brands and uh, well, producers and songwriters, how they can make a living off that. However, on the continent, we don't tend to do that because we've neglected certain things, certain Certain, such as, for example, simple things like split sheets, for example, how the importance of having a split sheet once you're in the studio, once the composers and authors have created something, completing a split sheet so that the royalties can be allocated correctly, understanding the purpose of a publisher even, because more, than, more often than not, when I'm starting the conversation about publishing, people think it's publishing to do with distribution, because I'm, everyone's used to hearing you've published a book, oh, publishing, so publishing automatically, they say, no, I've got a distributor, whereas no, Publishing has a whole different meaning. And, and this is the challenge which I'm super excited about. And we've got some very exciting things in the pipeline. And we're, we're really hoping to, to build in such a way that we start, we begin seeing songwriters and producers having sustainable careers where that they don't have to feel the pressure of becoming a performing artist because they see that's where the money is in gigs. Where they're comfortable and they're seeing enough royalties, they're seeing the money coming in such a way that they can actually focus and do what they need to do. So yeah exciting That's incredible times. monetizing your catalog through publishing is definitely the way to go whether it's through licensing or synchronization getting placement on movies or in adverts we see other um genres and other industries really thriving off of that like you said having longevity with their career because they're not focused on the hit right now but they're, they're able to monetize their catalog and eat well for a very long time so i love that we do have a question from ken gakuo hopefully i've said your name properly um, and then we'll move on to the next question um so mvq you touched on tiktok and i think when you also mentioned that you know as the internet population increases in africa we're going to be seeing a lot more development um quick facts in nigeria the internet population is only 40% and we're still getting the crazy numbers that we are. Based on what surveys you look at, the population in Nigeria is between 200 and 250 million people. So if everyone has access to free internet or at least affordable data, I'm sure we're gonna see jumps in streaming and of course in influencer challenges on TikTok. And so that brings me to Ken's question, which says, how can my journal get marketed? Who would like to take this one? What is the best form of marketing in this day and age? Any takers? If not, I think we'll answer um, this um, so is it, is it Just to, to understand the question, sorry, is it, he's asking how can, so I'm reading question, how can my journal get marketed? His journal being his, his music? I believe so. Oh, I think he's talking about the genre. Got you, right? the genre. Oh, so, yes, the he genre. can define his sound. Yes. Yeah. How does he promote his genre? That's a Munya mm -hmm. question, clearly. He's a, he's a king of publishing, so. <laughs> <laughs> How can my genre? So, I mean, now this, I guess, when it comes to something with a genre, I mean, so currently it sounds like he's the only person. He created this genre himself. I mean, so in terms of popularity, you know, I always, I, I'm a strong believer in hometown advantage, where if, if, if anything is to become popular, you need to have within your your surroundings, your your nuclear, whatever, whoever's close to you, to create that, um, that hometown support for people to recognize it. And I think that, that's why the advent with, with genres like I'm a piano and the like, that have now also just grown in, in, um, globally, that have become global sounds, it's also about, it, but it all started at home. It started in South Africa where people were just vibing it to the point where you couldn't ignore. So, I mean, ultimately, I would, the advice I would give with, for the genre is, you know, if, if, if people in Kenya, within, his, within, his, within Kenya, where, wherever he's from in Kenya, to start getting, to, to, if, if, it comes, if it becomes popular amongst the people, trust me, it'll become popular amongst everyone else. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, work, it, work, work the music. Work your music locally. Um, getting a play, having experiment with it. Collaborate with other writers and, and people to jump on the genre as well. And yeah, I'd say those would be some of the tips I have. Amazing. Get that local support. Um, and also be your best promoter. Like no one's going to promote your music more than you do. Um, if I give you the four pillars of publicity, just very quickly, the four P's that I work with are promo, playlisting, publications, and um, press. And I'll unpack that probably another time because I don't want to derail the conversation. But promo is everything from online to offline promotions. Playlisting is editorial and independent playlist because you'll find a lot of independent curators have a very strong following. Press is everything from TV, radio, podcasts, YouTube. Um, and then the last one I said was promo playlist doing press. Publications. So getting yourself into the blogs, into the magazines, especially if it's a brand new genre, you'll find that some people will be interested in covering that um, as Afrobeats and African music explodes, uh, explodes across the globe. Aldi, did you want to jump in? Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Now that we've answered Ken's question, thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to just encourage everyone to please get involved in the Q&A box, We're answering all the questions, and we'd like this to be as collaborative as possible. Okay, up next, uh, let's talk about what comes after Afrobeat. So we've touched on publishing and possibly monetizing catalog. Um, MDQ, you touched on having more show opportunities, more festival opportunities. But the question is, what comes after Afrobeats? Why and how? Lawyer, we haven't heard from you in a bit. Should we jump to you to answer this one? What comes after Afrobeats? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? D'accord, bien sûr. <laughs> what comes after Afrobeats? Why and how? Ah, this is a vast question. For me, uh, Afrobeat, uh, uh, it's something uh, about sp spiritual, uh, like in uh, my country and uh, my country uh, uh, around Réunion, Madagascar. And we have, uh, uh, we do, we dance music for communicate with spirit, you know? And uh, people dance uh, all the night, uh, and the same all the night, uh, and they, they become uh, in in trance uh, with drums only with drums and uh, in, and and voice. For me, uh, uh, Afrobeat is 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 the, this genre of, of music. Is you can feel you happy, and uh, it, it's it full your body and full your spirit too. Uh, it, for me, uh, this is um, important because uh, music ha have to uh, serve you and uh, people uh, uh, want that, you know. Amazing. Would anyone like to add to that? What comes after Afrobeats? And I might just encourage you um, with regards to a reminder on the possible new Grammy category. Um, also, the dedicated Billboard charts that we have in the US, as well as the dedicated BBC charts that we have in the UK. Um, MDQ, would you like to take this? Yeah, I'd like to say something. For one, I think um, it's almost difficult for me to imagine what comes after Afrobeats because I think we're just starting to unpack what this Afrobeats thing could actually be for the whole country. I think we are even in the early days of understanding that, you know, Afrobeats is not necessarily Nigerian music, just as a, as a consumer, right? And, and so, um, I think it's extremely exciting. I think Afrobeats is here to sit with us for a hot minute. The things that are interesting to see, you know, as an artist and as a fan of music first, for example, has been this conversation that Afrobeats, you know, understanding of Nigerian music is having, say, with Ama Piano, which is, you know, this subgenre of, of house or own genre, and Pia. If you just listen to the music marriage, that the two sort of 
from the two sounds are creating. It's literally creating a path that didn't exactly exist. Um, and that space is allowing more and more people with unique sounds to think about, you know, how do you interface with Afrobeats? What's the best thing about Afrobeats that you can borrow as a creator? What are the best things about Afro House? What are the best things about Amakiyama? How do you then apply that to your local context? You know, how you know I think I think perhaps the way I would imagine it is not so much a what happens after Afrobeats, but like, what is the new phase Afrobeats is going to take? And I think Afrobeats is going to localize. So when Afrobeats um, or um, say Afro House or say Ama Piano collides with Zimbabwean Mbira, something is going to happen there. When it collides with Bongo Flavor from Tanzania, something is going to happen there. When it collides with Kuduro, something is going to happen there you know, from Angola. And I th think we're going to see more and more localization and then exportation of the thing that is made locally to the diaspora of that thing. I think we're entering into a really interesting, or I predict that we're going to enter into a very interesting place where um, as the sound localizes, that constituency then pushes it out to its diaspora. Right. So you could have a second wave, a third wave of Afro, because the first wave of Afrobeats is clearly Nigerians who are championing it. And shout out to everybody who's in the sector who's made that thing happen. We have Ama Piano, which has come in, you know, shout out to everybody who's working there. We're going to keep seeing waves and waves of this thing. Ama Piano itself is literally at, you know, kind of this place where it's ripe for some mashups. You know, because that there's a very strong identifier. I want to. I'm curious to see if South Africa are going to let other people lead so that then we can export the sound out. You know. Um. So I think, yeah, the summary of what I'm saying is not so much what happens next. We are just at the beginning of what Afrobeats can do uh, for the continent and for the music enterprises in the continent. Amazing. And I feel like you're seeing that translation and localization already with the controversial term Afro piano, with a lot of West Africans taking on the piano sound. Um, and that's not just limited to Nigeria. We have a viral TikTok star by the name of The Therapist, who's just released a track called Nap, which is I'm a piano. It's got the log drum, it's got the shakers, but it's localized to Sierra Leone, which is where he's from. I completely agree. Mr. Aldu, did you want to jump into this there? Yeah, so I, I kind of missed some of the good things MDQ was saying, but I think um, uh, I think one thing that's critical for us to understand is that um, I mean, you're in PR, Gracie, so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, There's something about branding, right? These names are not our names for the most part, right? These names were given to us. And it might seem like a small thing, but I think it's critical for us to name ourselves. Uh, and not be named. So even the term Afrobeat for me doesn't do anything for me, personally speaking. It's their interpretation of what we're saying. We're saying, oh, you're Afro, African, anything African is Afro. I remember that 30 years ago, Afro was what I don't have, which is a lot of hair on top of your head, right? Um, <laughs> so um, these changes, th these things change all the time. Um, and now they say it's Afro this. So add anything and just put Afro on is good. I think we need to define those things for ourselves. I think it's important to name it uh, because you see what you're called determines who you'll be and that's why our parents were very careful when they named us they didn't just give us names Munya definitely means something i know what Mutani means i don't know what lawyer means but i know that Audu means servant of god and i hope i'm serving god the, <laughs> the way i should but it means something so we can't just call the names like that so that's the first thing i want, want to say the second thing is that you're absolutely right mdq that we've not started the journey by the way right um it's amazing to see the work that you guys are doing i'm so impressed and the consistency over time but what is critical is africa first for me i've always been an advocate for africa first when i thought about doing geography from the beginning my aspirations were entirely african because i knew that if we capture africa we, cap we capture the world because the world eventually will come to africa so um i think we need to rethink about the internal structure that fortifies afro music 
in such a way that even when the fad, and if it's a fad, dies away, we are strong in our community. And if you look at what hip hop has done, it's, it's quite similar. Hip hop is within itself by itself. And the only reason why Kanye West can sell whatever millions of records is because hip hop has supported it. There's a community, there's a hip hop foundation, there are all these things that built hip hop over the past 40 years or so. So I think that we need to come back home, right? I'm excited about what's happening internationally. That's good. But remember, those things are fads. Those are not first nature when it comes to culture. So how are we making sure that um, um, Focalistic can do a 10 city tour in Africa? That's what I'm concerned about, right? It's nice to have two or three prominent Afrobeat artists, but what if the trend dies? Then what? Meanwhile, we fail to build the infrastructure at home. So I know, for example, that 10, 15 years ago, P Square was doing 60,000 uh, 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 crowds across Africa. That's an amazing story. We didn't build on that. Let's build on that. Um, the third thing I just want to, also want to say around, just around the whole Afro piece and what's next is that I was going to say Afro world, but that sounded so corny. But the world is African, right? It's our world. It's our time. So we need to understand that we're in a better position to bargain for the future than ever. And, and we must think through what that process is. Otherwise, the work that has been built over the past 15, 20 years collapses, and then we're back to struggling for airplay again. So the only way to fortify that is to fix the local distribution. It's nice to have global platforms, but you need local distribution. And that is where our friend um, Ken comes in. If there's a local distribution and platform, people will relate with what he's creating because it's brand new. And while the world is preparing to get into it, he's already selling out locally. Uh, I'm a piano, for example. And what's interesting is that I don't even know what I'm a piano is anymore. Do you know why? Because it's now merging with Afrobeat. And you talk about the guy in Sierra Leone. So it's all a medley, guys. Um, so these, we shouldn't over stratify and, you know, put ourselves in boxes. We need to understand that it's one big box, a small little compartment, but we can actually remove the, those compartments and it's just one whole jack in the box uh, 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 thing. So, yeah, let's, let's keep understanding that it's Africa, the future is Africa, Africa is now, and we are Africa. Thanks. I love that. And it looks like Natalie Crew in the questions agrees with you. She says, over-reliance on the Western gaze in the US charts for mobility and visibility is a bit jarring for me. Unless you have the capital to politic and brush people's hands, it becomes a deep, dark, black hole. Fortifying the ecosystem on the ground across genres and manufactured borders is incredibly important and not whatever is popularized by the white Western gays. So yes, echoing what you said, Aldu, making sure that we fortify our local markets because at the end of the day, once that gaze is drifted, as we've seen it do with reggaeton and bashment and other genres in the past, we're still here. We still have to eat. It's still our music and it's still our ecosystem. With that said, then, how important is Africa's musical heritage upon its future? How much do we need to look to the past to kind of navigate the future? And I'm going to throw this one to MDQ. Um, that's a really, <laughs> you're full of good questions, Gracie. <laughs> um, so, as you can see, I'm struggling to answer this because I, this is a very good. Munya seems okay. like he wants to support. Do you want to jump in, Munya? Sure. Yeah, let, I, I can jump in just for a bit. Um, I mean, future in the past, without a doubt. I think, um, I think one of the things is definite lessons that we can learn from the past. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I found well, it was so crazy that um, it was in 2020 when I when I went back to a school called the Academy of Sound Engineering, um, and I was doing a master class in music business. When I came across one of the biggest copyright I think we've oh, lost Munya. We've lost Munya, just there. Okay. And he was about to tell so, us a really interesting story. So MVQ, we'll pass back to you. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why I hesitated is because I, I feel like at, at a creative level, that's a very loaded question. 
when you come from a heritage like mine. So Kenya has the misfortune of having been deeply colonized by 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 the British, and you know, um, a lasting legacy of that is kind of this confusion and disconnection between us and our ethnic groups. Um, it's very politicized and um, very disharmonious, so to speak. Then, um, as an artist, I think about like growing up, a lot of the music that I, I, I loved from Kenya um, was actually folk music. So in the 70s, we had lots of funk infusions. So we sang in our ethnic languages that we, the music was funk. And so when we started artistry and wanted to reference that, the thing we were told by the older um, uh, people in the sector and, you know, sort of by our the generation before us is that this isn't, this isn't Kenyan. The thing that you're sampling is Kenyan, but it was never Kenyan, it was foreign. And this dissonance in sort of kind of like not knowing where, where we are coming from, what is us, what isn't, has been a big part of the problem, I would say in the Kenyan music <laughs> industry. So extremely vibrant. Um, I think Audu would uh, attest to this. We're extremely vibrant. Kenya, actually, our main problem is we are over diverse if there's such a thing. Like, there's lots of everything. And it's taken us a long time to kind of figure out, so where do we come from in making a sound? From the outside, I recognize that there's nuance and, you know, lots of stuff that I'm going to miss out on. But from the outside, when we have watched say South Africa or Nigeria, the thing we have admired as artists from here is that these guys are cohesive. So even if um, genre wise, um, Fino is not the same idea as Ashake, the, we experienced a cohesion in the place where the music was coming from. And we've had lots of conversations. Is it like, is it pattern? Is it language? Is it like, a Nigeria sauce that we, you know, we cannot, you know, put together. We see the same thing from South Africa. By the time it comes to you, it's a thing called, you know, Afro house. And, you know, two songs have some kind of distinctions, but overall the thing itself is cohesive and it almost gives you like a, a template that you can now attach yourself to, right? So when you ask this question about, um, the role of the ethnic root kind of like in the music and like, where does that belong? Um, I think that's the challenge we are dealing with here at home to sort of decide what of these things is going to be useful, if at all. Because then when I also look to popular culture, we have invented two things as, uh, let me say, as city kids, <laughs> right? We've invented a genre called kapuka, which is our pop music. And then we have a recent invention called Gengeton, which is kind of built upon Kapuka, right? None of these things has any reference to any ethnic root. Um, but we can imagine as creators of music right now, and we are experimenting, that any of these sounds can interface really creatively with what we have understood Afrobeats to be and what we have understood Afro House or what we have understood Ama Piano. And there kind of lies our magic, you know, because we can make something and even if it doesn't speak to anybody's specific ethnic root it does speak to our experience kind of this urban kenyan experience which we have all kind of consolidated around it is my personal theory that that is the direction we're going to go in and i also think that once that happens there will be space for us to kind of interact with our ethnic root and also there will be a generation that is coming that doesn't have the burden of the politics and the division that came with ethnic identity form that many of us have to have lived through. You know, like I come from the biggest ethnic community in Kenya, but I've never felt comfortable to use my ethnic root in music because of what that thing means in politics and therefore in our socialization. You know, there's almost a it's almost dirty. I don't know how to say it. It's almost, it, it, there's a negative connotation to this thing. Um, and this is why I hesitated because I think there's a lot of nuance <laughs> when it comes to this question. I, I hope I've given some insights. 100%. And I'm so thankful for your transparency. I think 
as we move further away from colonization and we start to regain our own identities, um, each 54 African country, as well as, dare I say, lower down to the tribes, I feel like we, we'll, we'll slowly get there. Um, you mentioned Asha Karen. Um, I went viral on Twitter for calling his music Fuji Piano, but sonically, his references are very much Fuji, and Fuji, historically, is a, a West African, Nigerian, Togolese, Benin type sound. So I'm hoping that, that this is a window into what's going to happen next, where we're able to go back to our roots um, and infuse that in some kind of neo form um, to take it to the next level. Uh, Mr. Loya, again, I'm so fascinated because I, I rarely meet um, African artists that are into electronic EDM house, and I love the movement, by the way. But what do you think uh, when it comes to Afro um, beats um, and African music? Um, how important is our African music heritage? Uh, I think uh, we have to uh, experiment uh, in, a, a new, in a new dire direction. Uh, not to copy what uh, is uh, uh, we are hearing in Europe. Uh, uh, there's a lot uh, little artists in Indian Ocean that uh, uh, blend uh, traditional music, which is ternary with them, uh, which is not very popular in the world, with uh, electronic music. Uh, for me, uh, the future is, is this direction is is to be yourself, uh, your culture, uh, think about uh, it and uh, experiment uh, something uh, you think the future uh, will be. So uh, we have to learn uh, and uh, from uh, other musicians. Uh, and uh, learn uh, how ele ele electronic music is about, learn uh, uh, software like Ableton, and uh, uh, experiment ourselves uh, with uh, these uh, tools to create uh, our music. I don't think uh, we have to copy uh, Afrobeats, but uh, to uh, to to uh, produce uh, another thing i don't know but uh, uh, produce new new kind of music that uh, uh, he, he, he blend traditional uh, electronic or, or it can be electric like guitar to, uh, all sort of uh, uh, instrument and uh, the problem is uh, to uh, share the, this music with the world and how we can uh, distribute uh, this uh, kind of music. Uh, for me, uh, I, uh, I begin uh, with the, the local. Uh, I, I, I try to find a, a, a small uh, audience uh, and use the social network and uh, you know it, it's work because uh, it it it, it talks to people uh, they recognize uh, themselves in uh, this uh, new genre of music and uh, it's possible to to have a, a new business uh, can a new kind of business to live uh, with uh, this new kind of music I love that. And you touched on being new and distribution. So that leads me nicely onto my next question. What is the impact of Web3? Now, NFTs are buzzwords and cryptocurrency is a buzzword and everybody's trying to get into this new phase of technology. Um, but the question is, what is the impact of Web3? Now, I'm going to quickly define what it is just in case any of our participants don't know. So Web3 is an idea for a new iteration of the World Wide Web, which incorporates concepts such as decentralization, blockchain technologies, and token-based economics. Now, MDQ is looking to the sky, Aldo is looking to the left, <laughs> Aloy is giving me a blank face. So I would like to know um, from any of you, whoever would like to go first, um, do you understand Web3 
And do we think, or what is the impact of Web3 in our space? This is looking to the future now. So I'd like to say that I, <laughs> I understand Web3. Um, but interestingly, I actually do work in, 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 um, in the space of blockchain, actually, uh, working on a very interesting project uh, with the government of Barbados currently. Um, and it's basically around cultural heritage economy um, that is built on the blockchain. And what that does is surface 400-year-old um, information and uses that to basically connect people um, uh, from the days of the slave trade. But that's another conversation altogether. Um, but I do understand how blockchain technology works. And I understand what Web3, uh, vaguely, I must say, <laughs> what the implications will be. But uh, I think, think about it from, and I think Munio would, would appreciate this probably more, is that from a publishing standpoint, one of the biggest problems that you find is that the songs, uh, split sheets are an issue. People don't even record. I was, I was speaking with uh, someone, a client yesterday, and they did some work with some artists from some region of the world. And I was like, well, do you guys get a split sheet signed? And he said, they don't do split sheets. Like, they don't care about split sheets. Um, with blockchain technology, and with smart contracts, what it simply means that at the point that you're creating the songs, all those things come almost naturally with it. So you're able to, before the song is uploaded and all that, it's part of the process that you would have to sign the split sheet and get that signed. Now, to put it in context, the amount of money that's missing, or shall I say undistributed in, um, in, in the black box, as they call it, for music is over $4 billion. Uh, this is money from collaborations from songs that were dating by 60, 70, 100 years ago that weren't collected because the split sheets weren't complete. If you're doing publishing, there's no way you can collect on your royalties unless there's an agreement that these songs add up to 100%. Um, otherwise, you're wasting your time, right? So um, I think that that's what that does. It means that from the point of creation, that artistic process is supported by technology in such a way that this species uh, are signed automatically while or during the process before it's uploaded and all that. So it makes it easier to uh, for accountability. I think there's somebody else here on, on the chat who's doing something amazing with the metaverse and, and what the implications are. But I think the other iteration we need to think about is how everything is going to be like the metaverse means a virtual world. Um, there's a company I'm, I'm advising right now that is doing uh, NFT uh, music backed uh, metaverse concerts. They did one in December and they had about 6,000 people attend virtually. So think about how you can, uh, and just understand the technology is that basically I release music in the metaverse. I have a virtual conference, uh, sorry, concert. I'm sitting in this on this table right here. I'm playing the music. So lawyer right now, can live stream uh, his beautiful recording studio and is recording music from the comfort of his house. And people are paying tokens, either by Bitcoin or whatever it is, and they access this exclusive content. And this technology also allows him to say, you know what, I'm going to send you five pictures or five videos of me in the studio, right? It's exclusive and only you can have access to that. So the first 50 people who pay, or pay VIP tickets, get a chance to see lawyer, fiddling around with guitar, maybe he's playing with, with his band member. Okay. Something personal that's not out there in the space. And people are watching this from every part of the world. So if truly Afrobeat music, Afro house, um, Amma piano, um, Syria piano, whatever names you want to call these things, I actually get into that metaverse. It means that you have a virtual audience of billions of people who can tune in to experience the music, experience the culture. So that's my limited understanding of it, is that it's, it's actually an opportunity to, to scale globally. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that infrastructure in Africa because the internet is still, um, fiber is still, and access to these devices is still limited. So we have to figure out, again, back to my uh, postulation around localization, is that there are local, cheaper, faster methods to send this music and get ourselves kicked in. Remember that uh, at the peak of the crypto rave, Nigeria was the first or second most, second highest user of crypto in the world. Now, these are typically poor people. <laughs> Let's be honest, they are poor people. But why are they using crypto? Because they're very uh, aspirational 
they're very forward thinking and because they have to they have to uh what's the word they have to supersede right or they have to get across the look uh, the, the the problems that they have in nigeria we have in nigeria are so many that you have to live above that and what a better what what is a much better place for you to live virtually than the virtual world itself so people are thinking about how we can get out of our current situation and go to the next level and that is across africa because poverty is widespread so i think that that's my limited understanding of how we can begin to to plug that in and we need local tech companies to begin to think about um, um, local solutions uh, while the big companies do do what they're doing outside of, of Africa. Amazing. And we have Natalie to... cooperating. Sorry, MVP, give me just two seconds just to feedback what Natalie said and we'll jump to you quickly. And Natalie in the chat has said NFTs and Web3 are allowing artists and festivals to maneuver beyond politics and build community globally. She's then added a link to Amity um, and the Africa FM crew who are doing some incredible stuff. Festivals can do the same. And then she's also shared a link around some research if anyone is interested in working on NFTs. Um, so thank you for that contribution. Um, and DQ, back to you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I just wanted to jump on and build upon what Aldo had said. Um, my understanding um, around NFTs, specifically music NFTs, um, because that's the discussion here. I think if you think about right now, and I would say in the immediate short term um, of, uh, of NFTs for musicians, is that this, this is a path to build upon if you're already sitting with community. If you're an artist who isn't sitting on community, that is not the first place to start. Because um, if you look at really the way um, uh, NFTs, uh, NFTs are, are traded, um, the thing has to be extremely rare or provide a utility. Right. This is the thing that I've understood from the sort of different communities. You, it has to be extremely rare and or provide a utility. So a music NFT, I would get um, Loyer's uh, NFT, which is actually my it's the modern day, uh, you know, can I call it like special VIP pass? And I think I would already kind of alluded to that. So then it will allow me to maybe go backstage with him or um, access some music that um, only I can, only a group of us can access. What I'm trying to say is that the utility of NFT for music right now is really for super fans. And so one of the things I think um, I've found to be dangerous in the way the NFT story is being told is kind of like artists who are at, at the beginning, at the start of their career, it's like, okay, I have a song and I've made an NFT and now pushing it out there. You guys buy my NFT. And I don't think it's going to work because there's, A, there's limited utility, like, okay, so your album cover is a piece of art, fantastic, good for you. I'm not in with you already there has to be this kind of community that you then transition. Um, because even in your fa in your community, the people who are, um, so forget NFTs, let's think about it like in real life, yeah? You have 10,000 fans, your super fans are probably 100. The ones who are down to buy the vinyl and to uh, subscribe to your weekly newsletter and pay a certain premium to access you, maybe it gives them access to five gigs um, and that they can come backstage on those gigs and that you will send out a personalized birthday message. These things that we normally do with the super fans, that's what we're translating now. That's the way we should be thinking about NFTs, you know. Um, and yes, there is... Uh, this whole global community that you could have access to and that you could belong to. But the reality <laughs> of the matter is you have to build community. It doesn't matter that you can access 2 billion people. From 2 billion people, you have to mint your own community. You have to build your own community. So I think that um, the conversation that is being presented to artists, I, I, and again, it's, it's very US-led, right? It's, it's very coming from the people who are developing and sitting with the technology. Um, but I think it's very simplistic. And I think um, there's, of course, always going to be outliers. But for the, for, for the most part, um, NFT adaptation um, requires a utility and a community. 
And that's the thing that we should be talking to artists to build as they also build their understanding of blockchain, right? And just like the way that thing will come to service their career. Um, and then NFTs almost becomes like the third. I actually think that <laughs> we're probably heading towards the, the end of this NFT bubble. Or we are maybe somewhere in the middle of it. You know, when it came out, like NFT, everyone's an, an NFT. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a bubble uh, without the community and without the utility. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I completely agree. Community is needed. And in, in marketing, we have this thing called the eight step production ladder. Step one is where people don't know you, they've never heard of you, they've never seen you. Around step three, they might know your name, but they don't know your song or they know your song and they don't know your name. And then right at step eight is where you have the super fan, like you said, who would be engaged in trying to get a minted NFT, or even if we scale it back, Instagram has just started a subscription feature where you can subscribe to specific people that you follow. And um, as an artist, the best way to utilize that is to offer um, curated exclusive content to encourage people to subscribe. It is a paid subscription, a bit like Netflix. Um, uh, and I'll leave that there because I know that we only have 17 minutes left of this conversation. And I wanna make sure that we touch on the last two topics. Munya, welcome back. Uh, we know you experienced some technical difficulties and be prepared, okay? The next question is coming straight to you. So uh, the penultimate question of this panel is, what is the impact of the African continental free trade area and other trade agreements on African music today? So what is the impact of the African continental free trade area and other trade agreements, e.g. the African Growth and Opportunity Act? Uh, and what's that impact on African music today? Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm thinking this one maybe maybe start with one of the lawyers for this one. <laughs> Aldi, are we passing back to you as the resident lawyer on the panel? Yes. Yes. Um, sadly, it always comes back to us the bad guys, and um, hopefully, um, you guys will pay me my fees after this call. So, MDQ lawyer and Munia. Um, it will be cheap for you guys because I like you guys and because Gracie has been such an amazing uh, compare. So, but yeah, but seriously, um, uh, I I think that the AFCTA it's an amazing uh, development. Um, again, I, I I think I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I've always been a big advocate for African unity. Um, that's why this platform is amazing because we don't always get the opportunity to interact on this level and, and to talk. Um, I went to Blankets and Wine probably 10, 12 years ago, and it was such an amazing, like, I was like, this is crazy. Like, how does someone think of something like this? Uh, so you, you can imagine my excitement knowing that now this is uh, being taken to Rwanda and Ghana and all these places. And I think the question then is that, how do we scale brands in such a way that we have a truly African experience? If you come to the States or to Europe, you'll find that there's a McDonald's in every corner of the world. It's somebody's little idea, but it's been scaled uh, to, to a point whereby it is not in every major continent of the world, right? Blankets and Wine should be a global brand as well. It's a brilliant idea and it, it, it lends itself to that intimacy that you really get. How do we scale that? There are challenges to getting that brand, the company registered, you know, getting the directors, um, and being able to establish a company, pay the taxes and all these things. There's a, a currency problem, right? How do you do you pay in Naira to CDs and then, you know, how do you do those things? Uh, and then uh, what are the tax implications? You know, what is the ease of doing business in these things? So these are all the issues that come around when you think about establishing a brand and scaling. Um, uh, in 2012, we opened, we have a company in Nairobi, in Kenya. And that's because we saw the vision. We loved, we loved what we saw in Nairobi. We were like, look, we need to. And the minute we flew, so the first time we went to Nairobi was in 2008 for the MTV Awards. And we fell in love with the place, the weather, the culture, the food, you know, and we're like, Jesus. And I've been to other African countries as well, but Nairobi just lent itself to a special place. So the question then is, how do you register? You need to have a Kenyan partner. We had a Kenyan partner. We registered. We tried to settle some things. We spent money. We lost money. All these things are the challenges about doing music. So I'm sorry, business. So the AFCTA treaty is saying that primarily you can do business 
across Africa in a borderless manner and with little tax implications. That's what it means. It means it's easier for each set of businesses now than before. It means that there's a whole treaty that says, okay, your country will treat me like this, and this country will treat me like this. And I think it's about a 10%. This, this quota, I, I don't have it offhand now, but it's, there's a quota for, for, um, uh, for which you will charge a fee or some sort of taxes. But primarily, you can really, it's a borderless world. The second phase of that is one, Af one passport. So literally, think about the challenges. I, I, I've been, the last time I went to Nairobi, uh, sorry, South Africa, hey, I had a bad experience. I'm like, you know, I really will not go to South Africa unless I have to. Uh, and that's because, why am I being restricted? I'm African. Why, why should an American be able to fly in and sift through immigration? And because I'm Nigerian, I have to be stopped. And why should someone from Kenya need, Kenya and Nigeria have that pact? But what we're seeing is that Africa needs to have that pact. In the US, which is yeah, a quarter size of the Africa, you fly around anyway. In fact, in Canada, which is another country altogether. So that is what the AFCTA basically is talking about, is saying borderless business, eventually one passport for all Africans. You can fly in and fly out. But the third part that needs to be fixed is also the, the air, air, uh, airplane routes, because it's terrible. You, you'd be surprised that one time I was in Benin Republic and I was trying to fly to Ghana and it cost me a thousand dollars to fly. Yes, a thousand dollars to fly from. And it wasn't a direct flight. I had to stop by in, I think, uh, not Côte d'Ivoire. Yeah, I had to stop by in Côte d'Ivoire. Then it doesn't make any sense. Now, how does this affect our business? Um, I don't think that there's a clear provision on how the creative economy will benefit from that beyond, I mean, in the traditional music sense. But if you're talking about from company to company, yes, it means I can go and, and set up my company in Rwanda in such and such time, and the taxes are greatly reduced. But I don't think that there's a specific path around the creative industry. And that is why we need to get more involved in these conversations to understand the impact of these things. Because what, they mean, what, what that means then is that um, hmm. Can we do a concert for, say, let's say MDQ decides that she's leaving her the million she's made from her show and she wants to go on tour, for example. How do we create a touring circuit around 50 countries in Africa, right? How do we do that? How do we ensure that a lawyer can wake up tomorrow and say, look, I'm doing these things and the, 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 the visas, the work permits, all those things are seamless. Because remember, there's a work permit issue as well. Remember, there's a collecting management issue as well. So there's so many issues around that. I think we that work in the creative industry need to interface more closely with the Secretariat, which is out there in Ghana, and work on policies that affect all of us because the nuances and, 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 and the, the, the peculiarities of the music industry are quite different from setting up a company that does ginger or manufactures oil, for example. So um, that's, what, I don't, that's what I want to say. Um, that'll be $50 each. Um, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I'll say, I'll I, I, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I take Bitcoin as well, MDQ. I know you don't. You're not a fan, but yeah. I love that. Now, um, I feel like when you look at models like the EU, where there's free movement of goods, services, and people, we need more of that on the continent. Again, on Twitter, I'm a Twitter head. Apologies. Two weeks ago, there was a tweet that went viral that said, "Between the 54 countries, we should be visa free. There shouldn't be any borders." And I'm a big, a big advocate for that, especially when you touch on how convoluted the um, air routes are, where you might have to stop off in Kenya if you're going from Nigeria to Gambia, um, not just the prices. And when we know that the roads aren't always in the best condition, but also safety, um, the only way that we can truly be borderless is if we um, enable agreements like that and stick to them, um, even when we do have change in, in, in government. So um, thank you so much, Aldi, for that contribution. Okay, last but not least, we've got eight minutes left. I wanna make sure that we get closing comments from everyone. Um, we've had a really fruitful discussion today and I want to thank all of um, our participants in the comments that are really interacting. Um, it's great to see your contributions. Um, before we go though, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, what's the one time bound commitment, contribution or action that you are pledging to as an outcome of this panel to help creatives in East Africa truly embrace the new normal? I'll give that to you again. 
What's your one time-bound commitment, contribution, or action as an outcome of this panel that you are committing to to help creatives in East Africa truly embrace this new normal? Munya, we skipped you last time because we gave you a legal question. But we are going to start with you. We'll then go on to Loya, then Mr. Aldu, and then we're going to end with the first lady herself, MDQ. Munya, would you like to kick off? Absolutely. So just to get it clear, so you said, what's the one? So it kept on cutting out when you're saying that from Sorry. my side. What's the one? Time bound commitment, contribution, or action as an outcome of this panel that you're committing to to help creators in East Africa truly embrace the new normal? Oh, absolutely. Um, time bound commitment, um, as in giving accessibility to myself, or as in, or. <laughs> I'm trying to think. What are you um, committing to? Perhaps also um, committing to how on my website currently on the Moti Africa website, um, we're actually I'm actually planning on making it free. So actually I'll make it I can make it free earlier in terms of some of the videos that we've got created that explain just the key key business things that need to be, you need to be aware of prior to wanting to step into the industry or even if you're in the industry, understanding what the key different players do. Um, all you'd have to do is go into my website and I will give you free access to my platform. How about that? <laughs> I absolutely love that. Now, is that specific just for our participants right now or the guys that are watching on Facebook, YouTube and Amy, are they also eligible for this support? Well, I guess anyone who's watching right now, absolutely. All you need to do is go into the website. Um, I, will, I will make that, you just need to re just register and yeah and then then you should get free access absolutely I'll, I'll i'll work on putting that together for you guys amazing thank you so much munya lawyer well, over to you what time bound commitment contribution or action um are you committing to as an outcome of this panel to help east africans truly embrace the new normal but i'm ready to uh, to fly to uh, west africa right now and uh, <laughs> help uh, every artist I, I can uh, so I, I can uh, teach uh, uh, some uh, software some uh, hardware how to uh, to to produce music uh, that's uh, micro contribution I, I will talk with Mike with all other people and uh, I, I will be very happy to come and, and contribute uh, uh, with other artists to uh, to how uh, how to be a, a professional and uh, voila. Et voila. And what's the best way to contact you if we'd like to engage in that support? Uh, you can contact me by my uh, uh, website, loya at uh, uh, point er, e, or on my Facebook, you can uh, search uh, uh, loya project or Instagram lawyer project and uh, you can contact me anytime anywhere amazing support and training thank you so much mr aldu what can we hear from you commitment contribution or action as an outcome of this panel um i i will donate my clients uh monia uh, mdq and lawyer uh, anytime that you guys need anything i'll just have them that's my personal commitment on behalf of my clients. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, okay, no, but seriously, I'm not fooling around. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to um, help you guys uh, maybe do like uh, physical or virtual workshops for just the music business, especially the legal part of it. And I think it's really crucial for people to understand some of the rights, how deals are structured, and that helps to begin piece things together. So I'm really happy to do that and part of my and my team is Chocolate City as well. Um, I can have my CEO or one of my execs really coming out there, or, or if if the time is right, I can also fly out there at some point in time. We can do something. So definitely, um, we love that because we think that uh, the culture in East Africa is amazing. It's amazing people. So it, it irks me in a sense that we've not been able to get um, those global stars. They're there. They're there. Uh, and I think that sometimes you just need to uh, interact. And remember, like I said, everything that Africa, West Africa has done is 
really collaborative, stealing a bit here and there, you know, putting it together and creating a brand new product. So I think we should just be open to those collaborations and uh, we're really happy to support in any way. And thank you once again for the platform. Yeah. Amazing physical or online support for our participants in East Africa. MDQ, last but not least, what is your commitment, contribution or action as the outcome of this panel? Um, I had already made this commitment to myself, uh, but now I guess I'm putting myself on blast. Um, the commitment we're making is to transition, is to have a 100% transition for the artists that we will be producing music for onto Web3, um, specifically get them started in building their, um, their communities um, and to really build on the blockchain. Uh, my commitment is time bound because I start a, we start recordings in November and our project runs till January 2024. So what I'm saying is by January 2024, I should transition four artists um, to be full on on blockchain and NFT. Amazing. That is incredible. Thank you so much for that. And I guess my own little contribution, given that um, I'm in music publicity and I'm a radio host, if there are any artists that are watching right now, feel free to email me music at Gracie May. That's music at Gracie May. And I'm happy to offer you your first UK radio play um, as a way to expand your reach. Um, please make sure you have an electronic press kit and your socials and all of that so that I can make sure that I publicize you in the right way. But yeah, your first UK radio play on the Afro Nation show with myself and my co-host. Okay, um, we are right on the nose with time. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of the participants and everyone that has joined us for this panel. It's been really incredible to really unpack the topic for today, which was the evolution of Afro African music yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I have to obviously thank my distinguished guests on this panel. Your contributions have been invaluable and I hope that we can keep you to the commitments you've just made and um, to see how we can really progress and push music in East Africa. Um, thanks again to the hosts and I've been your lovely moderator Gracie May um, and I'm going to hand back now to the Ongea team to um, give us instructions for the next step. So thank you again for your time. It's been a great 90 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>